This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar titled, AML Non-Transplant Treatments, What's in the Pipeline? Thank you for joining us. My name is Angie Onofre, Director of Patient Education at AAMDSIS, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge Belgene, Takeda, and Agios, and the generous support of our patients, families, and caregivers for providing support for this webinar program. Today's presenter is Dr. Michael Savona. Dr. Savona serves as an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine and the Director of Early Therapeutics and Hematologic Malignancies at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Savona serves as a member of the Scientific Advisory Board at Curiofarm Therapeutics. He's also served as a Director of the Hawaii Medical Service Association and as a Director of Leukemia Research at Sarah Cannon Research Institute, where he spearheaded efforts to develop a Phase I program in hematology. He has also been the principal investigator on dozens of clinical studies and has been the lead investigator on studies of a, of a variety of novel compounds and hematologic malignancies. He has been involved in medical research for 20 years and has published extensively in major academic journals, including Nature Medicine, Blood, Cell Stem Cell, GAMA, and Nature Cancer Reviews. He is board certified in medical oncology, hematology, and internal medicine, and it, and is an elective fellow of the American College of Physicians. Dr. Savona obtained his bachelor's degree in philosophy from Davidson College and medical degree at Wake Forest University of Medicine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Savona. Thank you, Angie, and welcome, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. So today I'll be talking about uh, a little bit of a different topic, uh, not what our current standard therapy is, but where we're going, what's in the pipeline. So I have these disclosures um, listed here. So the agenda today, we'll start uh, talking about what a challenge AML is. Now, we've done better in some cancers lately. There are new therapies for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, there are new therapies for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and there are therapies for CLL and CML that have changed the face of the disease over the past five to ten years. AML remains a great challenge. Unfortunately, the greatest challenge among some of those common subgroups, subgroups particularly those patients ages 50 to 80, I'll move on to what I think is the dusk uh, of the time or the age of cytotoxic chemotherapy. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to, to delve into too much about epigenetic modification, but I do want to explain what that is, what's available now, and give an example of some of the development in that area. And I'll spend the majority of the latter half of the talk talking about bioenergetics and manipulating the kill switch in AML cells, how this is a real revolution in treating myeloid malignancies, not just AML, and how we best capitalize on new molecular diagnostics to best personalize therapy. So when you have a bone marrow biopsy, an aspirate and a biopsy are the two pieces that are obtained, and the aspirate looks like the bottom panel on the right. This is stained uh, with uh, two a color, red and, and blue stain, and the cells are what we call monomorphic and similar in appearance. The nucleus is the dark purple, and the cytoplasm is the light purple surrounding it, and these cells that have high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio are called blasts. This is a bone marrow aspirate for a patient with acute leukemia. Acute leukemia is driven by mutations that uh, lead to arrested development, so to speak, and ultimately dysfunctional cell death. Acute myeloid leukemia is the most common leuke uh, adult leuke acute leukemia in uh, adults. There's certainly more common chronic leukemias like CLL. It's a very aggressive disease, and in some patients, uh, if they go without treatment, they can die within days. And so we call this a medical emergency. 
nearly everyone who has AML dies from the disease or related complications. There are only select subgroups of patients um, that we're able to cure for with AML, and that's important. We know that this disease increases uh, in frequency with age, and we know that older uh, patients have some of the worst outcomes. The biggest challenge is in older adults. The disease tends to increase in frequency with age, peaking in the 60s and 70s. And patients between 55 and 85 years of age make up the majority of patients with AML. But as you can see on the right panel, the patients who are older tend to have the worst survival. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve indicating time on the x-axis and survival percentage on the y-axis. Patients less than, less than 50 are certainly not cured at the rate that we'd like to cure them, but we do have a long tail indicating close to 50% of the patients are cured under 50 uh, years of age. But historically, patients who are older have a median survival measured in a year or less, and long-term disease-free survival, the expectations of this are marginal. I hope at the end of this talk you're encouraged by things that are coming this way and improvements to lift these curves up, approaching the curve you see for the patients less than 50 and ultimately higher. We know that secondary AML is a subgroup with particularly poor progno prognosis. Secondary, secondary uh, AML includes uh, AML that derived from myelodysplastic syndrome or treatment-related AML, which is AML that occurs uh, years after therapy for, say, breast cancer, bladder cancer, or other solid tumor cancer for which anthracyclines or specific uh, topo-2 inhibitor type of chemotherapy is given. On the panel on the right, you can see patients with de novo leukemia. Actually, that curve is missing. I apologize. But you can see that um, the, the color coding seems to be a little bit off. But uh, you can see that the patients with de novo leukemia uh, tend to have a better survival than everyone else. But the worst survival is measured in patients with treatment-related disease. And this is an area of great need. So when we look at patients with AML walking into the clinic door, we tend to first look at phenotype. What are the specific things that help us determine what prognosis is? Age, performance status, functional and cognitive status, comorbid conditions, the patient actively having a heart attack or a stroke, antecedent hematologic disorder, i.e., do they have a prior MDS? Is this treatment-related? Is this a patient with breast cancer that may or may not be cured, but received chemotherapy and now has bone marrow disease secondary to that chemotherapy? Is the white blood cell count particularly high, indicating that it's an emergency and the white blood cells will grow high enough to clog off arteries and cause heart attacks, strokes, or other, and that needs to be intervened on immediately with either cytotoxic chemotherapy or leukophoresis, where the cells are taken off and filtered through a machine? We look at cytogenetics which is the study of the chromosomes within the blood cells. And we know that some of the favorable risk cytogenetics, such as core binding factor leukemia, and some of the poor risk cytogenetics, including complex, many alterations, um, and, and, and we call everything in between as intermediate risk. That's not good enough. We further subdivide patients by molecular abnormalities. And the first molecular abnormalities that were defined as prog prognostically relevant were li are listed here, NPM1, CVPA, FLT3, and CKIT. What I'll mention here is that CKIT mutation mitigates the good risk of a core binding factor leukemia, such as an inversion 16. Um, I'll use my arrow here if I can figure this out. Inversion 16 or a 821 leukemia, it mitigates the risk brings it down to a higher risk case if there's this presence of a CKIT mutation. Likewise, FLT3-ITD we know is poor risk, but FLT3-ITD in combination of NP1 is intermediate risk. It gets more complicated when you start looking at NPM1 mutations because some patients have NPM1 mutation and no other mutations, and that is good risk. But there are other mutations that tend to connote poor risk, even in the presence of NPM1. Here, you can see that the presence of specific myeloid mutations 
can help this, the uh, leukemia specialist determine which type of AML this is. In other words, if it's blue here, these tend to be mutations associated with uh, prior uh, myelodysplasia or prior hematologic disease, whereas these red uh, bars on this forest plot tend to indicate mutations or aberrations that are associated with uh, de novo leukemia, typically seen in younger patients. Now, one of the highest risk mutations is TP53, and we know the patients who have secondary type mutations, as I went on the last slide, tend to do fairly poorly. This has been articulated since this slide was developed, um, where patients with TP53 and complex mutations do even worse, and we have to be uh, cognizant of that when we're counseling our patients, specifically patients who have TP53 mutation in the, con in the, in the presence of a complex carrier type have a miserable statistically, epidemiologically, med overall median survival. So what does this mean for cytotoxic chemotherapy? Well, it means our therapy isn't good enough. The therapy that's been around for the past 45 years, this paper was first published in 1973, before I was an oncologist, um, by Dr. Yates and Dr. Wallace. Uh, and um, in this paper, they found, uh, just described how 16 patients with AML were treated with infusional cytarabine uh, or cytosine arabinicide, uh, much as we do today, and three days of daily donorubicin and, and had remissions in five of the eight untreated patients and two of the eight previously treated patients. And this defined uh, what we do uh, today with uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy. So 45 years, this has been the standard of care. Within the past decade, there's been slight variations on a theme where cyt uh, cytarabine and donorubicin have been uh, maximized to squeeze every drop out of this lemon we possibly can. And I think that analogy is uh, probably quite accurate. CPX351 is a bilamellar liposome uh, that goes through the wall of the, of the cancer cell and delivers the payload of a 5 to 1 molar ratio of cytarabine to donorubicin. That is the optimal uh, uh, stoichiometry or molar ratio between those two cells for AML within, in, in a patient. And interestingly, this simple approach took many, many years to develop. And I'll spare you some of the details of the Phase one and Phase two study, but the Phase three study, which hasn't been published yet but has been presented, compared CPX351, which is now known as Vixios, to 7 and 3, the standard of therapy, in patients with either treatment-related AML, patients with an AML a history of MDS, Patients who had a hist with or without a prior uh, hypomethylene agent, we'll talk about hypomethylene agents in a moment, um, or de novo AML with an MDS type karyotype. So they really looked for people between 60 to 75 years who had this poor risk disease. And the long and the short of it is the median survival is uh, statistically significant. It's imp improved where the blue curve is the patients who received um, the CPX351 and the red curve is the 7 and 3 patients. And a hazard ratio in medicine of 0.69 with a p-value of 0 0.005 is a statistically and clinically meaningful uh, result. The bottom line CPX351 showed superior efficacy in this older patient population. There were more responses, uh, more complete remissions, and more complete remissions with incomplete response at CRI, meaning that the blasts went away, but the blood counts didn't return to normal. The earlier mortality rates were lower, but because patients took a longer time to engraft or have return of normal cell counts in the, three, in the CPX351 arm, the overall mortality was the same. Um, with respect to uh, disease-related toxicity. But the outcomes following transplant were better with CPX, and patients with CPX did better in this therapy. So this is now approved and is the first-line therapy for older patients with high-risk AML.
But the bottom line is that median survival for patients treated in this trial was only 9.56 months. And most 60-year-olds with the diagnosis of AML, that's not sufficient. Another opportunity to try to squeeze a drop out of the lemon of cytotoxic therapy has been the advent of vozoroxin. Vozoroxin, formerly known as voralexin, uh, is a, a, quinol it's a quinolone derivative where um, the drug acts like um, an anthracycline. It inhibits topoisomerase 2. Don't worry about the detail except to know that it works like donorubicin, but it doesn't create free radicals that are thought to be the cause of cardiac damage. So there was hope that we could give, set, instead of 7 plus 3, give 7 plus V, vozoroxin, and have less anthracycline-associated cardiac death. But before using this up front, this had to be tested in the relapse refractory study, and this was the big uh, setting. And this was the biggest study ever conducted in AML, the Valor study, where 771 relapse refractory patients were randomized to receive either ARAC, which was debatably standard of care, versus ARAC plus vozoroxin at 90 milligrams per meter squared. There were a lot of second induction cycle of vozoroxin at 70 milligrams per meter squared and then consolidate if they reached a complete remission. Consolidation is typically with intermediate or high-dose ARAC in the same dose that's listed here, one gram per meter squared. As you can see, um, these are Kaplan-Meier curves with almost um, transposed Kaplan-Meier curves with but what you have to remember is that this is 700 patients, so very little difference uh, you know, needs to be seen to actually have a statistically significant meaningful difference. And in fact, the statistics on this reveal a p-value 0.061, which means 94% of the time um, the, uh, the results favor a better survival um, in the vozoroxin plus ARAC than the ARAC alone. It means 94% of the time that's real and not due to chance. Typically, a uh, study is positive if the difference that's detected is uh, statistically significant insofar as 95% of the time we can say that's due to um, a, a true difference rather than um, a 94%. So interestingly enough, this drug has not been approved and was denied by the regulatory authorities on the grounds that the p-value was 0 0.06 instead of 0 0.05. It's worth noting that there were statistically significant improvements um, among uh, different subpopulations, i.e., the patients who uh, received allogeneic stem cell transplant. There was an um, improved survival for patients there, 5.3 to 6.7 months. And there was an improved survival on patients over 60 years of age, showing a median survival for patients over 70 years, 60 years of age of 7 versus 5 months. The take-home message here, unlike the last slide, well, let me, uh, before I get there, I'll just say that um, because that, te that, that drug was tested in the relapse refractory setting, we aimed to test this before we knew the results of that study in the upfront setting, giving patients with undiagnosed leukemia the opportunity, I'm sorry, untreated leukemia, the opportunity to receive Vozoroxin plus Cytarabine in a 7 plus V fashion um, to hopefully avoid some of the cardiac toxicity given to 7 and 3. Uh, this, the results of this have been presented in preliminary form at uh, American Society of Hematology meeting, um, and we'll be pre pre presenting the final results uh, at this year's meeting. The reason it's dust for the cytotoxics is just like Vixios or CPX351, Vozoroxin does show a benefit in some populations over 7 and 3. But is 7 and 3 really the standard of care? And how long will it remain so if, if one insists it is? And I'll uh, allude to this in just a moment. Also, I'm not going to talk much about gemtuzumab, but I'm listing this as, as in under cytotoxics because gemtuzumab ozogamycin or mylotarg uh, is a drug that's been around for over a decade. It was removed from the market um, after some uh, controversial, difficult to interpret clinical trial data by Pfizer, which made the drug. And then it was recently uh, re-entered um, 
uh, and, and is now FDA approved and used in certain types of leukemia. Uh, gemtuzumab is under cytotoxic here because it's a monoclonal antibody to CD33, meaning it attacks CD33 positive leukemia, which is you know most leukemias. It does come with some specialized toxicity. I won't get into that here, except to say that um, there are some instances we'll use the drug, but the the um, the clock's on. And soon the the use of these drugs will become less and less justifiable as our new therapy uh, takes a hold. So what about epigenetic therapy and what is epigenetic? So epigenetic is, like it sounds, epi or outside of genetic, the genome. So basically these are changes that are normally made and hijacked in cancer to change the way the gene genes within the genome are transcribed. The most common epigenetic modification is the uh, DNA methyltransferase inhibition. And those of you on the call have surely heard of DNA methyltransferase inhibitors or 5-azacytidine or decytabine. 5-azacytidine is Videza and decytabine is Dacogen. These drugs do have uh, some utility in acute myeloid leukemia, leading to complete remission rates of anywhere to 5 to 25%, depending on which clinical trial or uh, a data you believe. Um, there's been reports at both ends there. And uh, patients who don't have complete remission sometimes have an improvement in transfusion need uh, or an improvement in neutrophil count so they have less chance of having infections and have higher quality of life. One of the problems is that once you're on that therapy, you have to continue the therapy until toxicity or progression uh, if you're not going on to stem cell transplant. And Getting this therapy is a commitment and certainly detracts itself from quality of life because it demands therapy IV, or in the case of azacytidine, can be given subcutaneously every day for for five to seven days in a row uh, every month. So that's one and a half to three hours of a patient's day uh, for five to seven days in a row every month. And that's not lost on people who take care of leukemia and MDS. Now, before we talk, uh, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about um, these grayed out uh, options, but I do want to mention them here. Aztec 727 is an oral formulation of decitabine that's given with something called a cytidine deaminase inhibitor. So normally, if you take decitabine or azacytidine by mouth, it's uh, deaminated in your gut and liver and it never gets in the bloodstream. This program is an opportunity to allow decitabine therapy to be given to people orally uh, and will likely be approved in 2019 or 20 uh, and will really change that whole uh, issue, quality of life I mentioned on the, uh, a few moments ago. CC486 is developed by Celgene, and interestingly, there was no cytidine deaminase inhibitor given with CC46, so what the developers of this drug did, myself included, uh, changed, changed the dosing um, and, and the dose and the dosing regimen of this drug. And what that did was change the way the drug works. So it's really very different than 5-azacytidine, even though the original design was to try to mimic 5-azacytidine by mouth. I'll go on and talk about novel agents. Um, I just want to mention, I'll be mentioning one, pevanetostat, but there's other novel epigenetic drugs I won't mention, um, such as PTEF beta inhibitors, DOT1L inhibitors, LSD1 inhibitors, BET inhibitors, all showing promise early in the clinic. And probably some of the most interesting things are yet to arrive at the clinic, and these, uh, as far as epigenetic management go, and these are specifically PRMT5-directed um, tar uh, targeting. So let's move on here to talk about guadacitabine, which is uh, your uh, not your father's Ozomobile DNA methyltransferase inhibitor, but uh, new and improved. So guadacitabine essentially tags on this uh, deoxy um, uh, this deoxyguanosine to the decitabine molecule, thereby making it more bulky and thicker, and allowing it to be given subcutaneously, and allowing for a slow uh, metabolism of the drug in the subcutaneous tissue, ultimately in a prolonged uh, exposure that may um, translate to better efficacy.
And I'll show you, this is our um, phase two data we published in the Lancet Oncology this past year, where, um, you know, a good number of patients on either a 60 or a 90 milligram per meter squared dose received a considerable uh, remission. And then, you know, even if you didn't have a full remission, patients developed uh, what's called a, a CRI or a complete remission with incomplete recovery. So this means, you know, the blast count maybe went down from 25% to, to 2%, less than 5%, but there's still low platelets, um, as noted by the P, or there's low neutrophils. Um, and this is like the total uh, C, uh, complete remission with incomplete recovery, so plus the uh, CR. So you're talking about, you know, 55 or 54% up to 59% or so uh, patients getting um, a good enough marrow to go to stem cell transplant as far as reduction of leukemia goes, and uh, what's traditionally been considered a reasonably good response associated with improvement of survival. Now, um, you know, this is generally well tolerated, uh, but there are some injection site reactions, as you might imagine. Um, some people don't tolerate that. There are increased risks of febrile neutropenia that seem to be a little bit more than decitabine or azacitidine alone. We'll test that in the phase three study that's ongoing. Um, I think it does add a novel um, DNA methyltransferase inhibitor or hypomethylating agent therapy to patients who really are not fit to get a, a cytotoxic chemotherapy. And testing this versus standard of care chemotherapy is currently underway in the ASTRAL-1 study. The question is, um, what's going to be the role for this when some of the novel therapy I'll mention at the end of this talk becomes standard of care? Cure is unlikely, and if you do get a response with glutacitabine, you either go on to stem cell transplant, or if you're not a stem cell transplant candidate, you continue to have uh, weekly, you know, once a month, you have uh, five to ten days of therapy with glutacitabine, which again is a diminished quality of life, especially for people who live far away from their infusion center. Next, I want to move on to, as I mentioned, um, one of the novel uh, epigenetic modifications. This is fairly complicated, and I know this is a patient uh, audience, so I'll just briefly mention that um, pevonidostat is a NET8 activating enzyme inhibitor. Um, essentially, in, in acute leukemia, there's an increase of a, of a type of post-translational modification called netilation, which is a type of ubiquination, and this drug kind of slows that slows that down. There's plenty to read about this. Ronan Swords, uh, who is the author of this uh, paper that we authored in 2018, reference on the bottom right corner of the slide, uh, has uh, developed this drug for several years and has several publications easily accessible via PubMed or Google. Um, you can see on the right panel here that in our phase uh, 1B study of patients treated with uh, azacitidine plus pevonidostat, we took elderly patients who we didn't think were going to benefit from or have a uh, high risk of, of toxicity with uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy, and we gave them uh, pevonidostat and azacitidine. And um, this is an intention to treat analysis, meaning even patients who uh, didn't receive any drug, but once they signed consent, we counted them on the study. So if you look at the bottom of the um, y-axis here, these are uh, almost 10 patients who had no benefit but didn't get, weren't a valuable with respect to having enough therapy. Some of those patients, their AML progressed too, too rapidly. Some of them didn't get drug at all. But for an intention to treat analysis, 50% of the patients had a response. And in an evaluable uh, analysis, i.e., the patients who made at least one month of therapy from here on up, you're talking 60% of the patients receiving a complete remission, which was very exciting. The downside is that the mean overall survival was not very much improved. And though there was a tail of patients with high risk disease that remained disease free three, three years later, that number is not high, as you can see by the number of patients at risk here. What's probably the most interesting point of this uh, uh, 
uh, development is that patients who have this really high risk green line secondary AML, they did actually better than some of the patients who don't have uh, higher risk AML. So there's potentially a role for pevonistat and more higher risk secondary AML. Specifically, we're testing this now in a study um, here at Vanderbilt and other centers around the country, pevonistat and relapse refractory myelodysplastic syndrome or MDS-MPN patients like CMML or other MDS-MPNs. And these patients really have very little available to them um, with a with the epidemiologically median survival measured in uh, four to eight months after failure of their hypomethylating agent. Likewise, um, there are other centers like City of Hope uh, that are testing pevonidostat um, with uh, decitabine, again, similar to azacitidine, in higher risk AML, trying to tease out that secondary um, AML uh, risk profile. And this is the part that I'm looking most forward to talk to you about is, is, is the new developments in bioenergetics and how we find the kill switch in acute leukemia. Because this really is a revolution in treating not just AML, but all uh, myeloid malignancies. So I'll start by uh, referencing um, the Hannah Hannah Weinberg um, articles where the Cancer was described by the by hallmarks of cancer in 2000, and then in 2011 updated to try to address some of the things we are trying to do about this. And, and I, I encourage you to uh, find these references and read these papers because it gives a lot of insight into the new uh, drug development. Um, as you can see here with the red circles, I've identified places that. Um, uh, are being addressed in AML specifically. These aren't the only places being addressed, but some of these places like EGFR is more relevant to lung cancer, um, hepatic growth factor and cement more, you know, more relevant to uh, liver cancer. I'm sorry I didn't circle telomerase inhibitors, but there's certainly, um, you know, uh, replicative intensity. This should be circled uh, as well. So lots of different places to intervene uh, to improve of the long-term survival and quality of life in patients with AML. So again, just to remind you, um, not to be cynical, but the expected outcome from induction of 7 to 3 is not good. Patients over 60, remission rate can be okay, um, but it's almost never curative. Patients who are younger, remission rate's a little higher, and there are a number of patients who are cured. And this is why this drug remains, these, this drug combo that's been around since 1973 remains a standard of care because we know we can cure some patients with it. The problem is, is 10% of the patients or so who are less than 60 and up to 20% over 60 suffer treatment-related mortality with this very intense therapy. It's important to know that the five-year overall survival with cytotoxic chemotherapy, even in young people, is, is not as good as it needs to be, and it's pathetic in patients over 60, which drives a lot of the innovation that we're talking about today. Now, with DNA methyltransferase inhibitors or hypomethylators, azocytine and, and decitabine, the response rates are about the same, maybe a little lower. It's never curative. Treatment or mortality is lower. But again, five-year survival is measured in the single digits and negligible, indicating we have to do better. So I alluded to how we would talk about bioenergetics, and I, I uh, am referencing um, in talking about starting with IDH uh, mutations, uh, a fairly uh, complex uh, theory in biochemistry relating to the citric acid cycle and most practicing physicians thought they were done learning about the citric acid cycle in their second year of medical school, but it turns out that these things are actually really important. And in some acute leukemias, IDH2 mutants actually disrupt the citric acid cycle to create an increase in this oncometabolite called 2-HG or 2-hydroxyglutarate. IDH2 mutations and IDH1 mutations are very similar, except the IDH2 are in the mitochondria, within the mitochondria, and IDH1 occur in the cytoplasm, kind of floating around the soup uh, of the cell. In both instances, increased 2-HG or increased 2-hydroxyglutarate, that oncometabolite, um, cause a, a lot of problems. 2-HG is used, uh, starting to be used as a cancer biomarker. We're trying to figure out how to do that. But it, but it um, leads to this uh, stabilization of a uh, hypoxia-inducible factor, which leads to more cancer growth. And most importantly, and this is the epigenetic kind of um, 
interplay between this targeted bioenergetic um, uh, molecule and epigenetics, the 2-HG, the oncometabolite, actually inhibits the normal function of an epigenetic uh, modifier called TET1 and TET2. So, in other words, 2-HG slows down some of the normal cell maintenance conducted by these guys. There's now one IDH2 inhibitor, which I'll talk about, and it's approved, um, AG221 or anacidinib. And there's several IDH1 inhibitors that have um, entered into clinical development. The epidemiology of IDH1 and IDH2 mutations are uh, notable to have uh, very genetically defined populations, where IDH2 mutations are um, seen in this rare type 2 uh, DHG aciduria, um, not in my field, but certainly uh, neonatologists will see this. Um, and then uh, IDH1 mutations occur in, in some uh, rare sarcomas like chondrosarcoma and actually in brain cancer in, in high frequency. As far as myeloid bone marrow disease goes, IDH2 is more common, making up about 20%, um, a 20% uh, chance of having an IDH2 mutation in a myeloid disease, and uh, about half of that in, 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 uh, with respect to IDH1. This is underscored here with analysis of uh, 826 patients uh, who um, uh, had uh, AML or had a full uh, uh, genotyping completed, and that genotyping revealed IDH2 mutations in about 20%, and IDH1 mutations in about 10%. And 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 these uh, R132 just basically indicates the spot within the gene the mutation occurs. And as remarkable as it is that people have been able to identify this, uh, it's important to to know as a patient that you have an R132 IDH1 mutation or you don't because some clinical trials and some drugs only work on specific mutations within these um, different uh, genes. Interestingly, we've discovered that IDH mutations are associated with older age, normal cytogenetics, and uh, the FLT3 ITD and NPM1 mutations. They're also associated with these MPN-derived AML, i.e. people who have uh, myelofibrosis fibrosis for years or polycythemia who then develop uh, AML. There tends to be a lot of IDH mutations in there. We also know that IDH1, IDH mutations tend to develop at, at diagnosis because people who have um, wild-type uh, IDH or normal IDH uh, at the diagnosis, ne you know, never go on to develop an IDH mutation when they relapse or later in their disease, indicating this is a founder mutation. So briefly, I'll just talk about where these drugs are in development. First, enosidinib, the IDH2 inhibitor. Um, there's a, 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 a trial that was done, and this is probably the quickest a drug has ever been approved by the FDA. It's they're certainly the quickest in myeloid disease that I'm aware of. There's a dose escalation study that, uh, that escalated very quickly. A lot of big centers put on patients with IDHT mutations identified quickly. An expansion of 126 patients um, in various different groups you can read there. Uh, and then a phase two single agent, um, oops, sorry, a phase two uh, single agent one-arm study of 91 patients indicating uh, who uh, received um, the the, uh, the phase two dose of uh, enosidinib um, and were monitored for safety and tolerability and uh, preliminary efficacy. And on this phase two, the drug was approved, not even uh, needing a phase three, although there is a post, uh, post-marketing phase three demanded by the FDA. This drug was approved on the 91 patient phase two study. And here's why. Um, the overall response rate was pretty decent. Um, Oops, with, um, sorry, technical difficulty, with 40% patients with an overall response, um, including CRs of uh, 20%. Sadly, the median survival for patients who had a, um, um, the median duration of response, rather, for the patients who achieved a CR was only eight months. So even with a directed therapy like this, patients developed resistance to this molecule. A couple of practice points. It's very important for some of my um, 
uh, referring physicians, but also for patients to understand, is that it takes months for this drug to work. Really, we see the peak complete remission rate around seven months. This is from the paper that Aton Stein published this past year in Blood. So really, up to seven months are needed to tell if it's really working. There's certainly signs. This person had 37% blast. You can see these monomorphic cells again uh, that... Um, at day 15, started to go away. You start to see more normal-looking cells like this one and this one. It's really not important if you can pick these out. It's more important that your pathologist can. And then cycle three, day one, the blasts were down to 4%. where you see a lot more normal-looking cells in the bone marrow. Now, that overall survival is not good enough. Those, that um, duration of response in patients who have a CR is not good enough. So really, the future in IDH inhibitors is going to be uh, in uh, you know, combination studies. And, and there's some hope that these combination studies, particularly the ones in, in yellow, uh, will lead to a longer disease-free survival. And I don't have time to get into that today, but I wanted to uh, put that out for you. If a patient has a FLT3 ITD mutation and an IDH mutation, for example, going on this study would be particularly attractive. I'm particularly excited about Venetoclax, uh, which I'm going to spend the majority of the time, uh, remaining time, talking about. So this is kind of complicated, so I, I ask you to bear with me. Um, so, So... BCL2 family proteins are in charge of deciding when it's time for the cell to die. And this was kind of discovered um, uh, accidentally in uh, taking care of patients with lymphoma back in the uh, 80s, where the BCL2 gene was found to be fused to this IDH um, uh, gene in a uh, in a uh, in the 1418 translocation, and these two were together. So what that meant is you had more BCL2 expressed. Which also, what's also interesting is the increased BCL2 expression didn't cause the lymphoma to go crazy. It just stopped the body's normal way to uh, to lead to cell death. In other words, it, it screwed up the the fact the uh, machinery around cell death because it is a complex machinery. But it didn't it stimulate the, the tumor to grow. So that's an important thing to remember. And it's also important to know that there's a lot of BCL2 family members, and that's key to the final part of this talk. But um, lymphomas are almost entirely reliant on BCL2 itself. Okay, so this is the most complicated slide, and I'm going to spend a minute on it just to um, orient you, and, I, and just please bear with me. This is a cartoon from Tony Gwatai, uh published a couple of years ago. Really, and Tony is uh, who we thank for making this uh, very clear to the, the world. Anti-apoptotics are these BCL2, um, and BCLXL, these, these um, what we call uh, immortal um, aggravators. So in cancer, these guys really turn on. And what happens is if you make a lot more of these anti-epoptotics, they bind to the mortal proteins or the proteins that turn the death signal on. So as part of normal homeostasis, cells turn over and should die. And these proteins in green are responsible for um, mixing up with Bax and Bac, which are the actual the proteins that control cell death, and getting them to change conformation from this um, straight-looking one here, and when it binds, gets to turn to this to this activated-looking one. And when they're activated like this, what happens is um, this protein starts to leak through the wall of the mitochondria, and we call that mitochondrial automembrane permeabilization. permeabilization. So that's a mouthful, but it basically means cell death by activation of this protein by deactivation of this protein. So that's a lot of detail. I guess that what I want you to, to take home is that there's a series of proteins that are responsible for keeping the cell alive, and there's a series of proteins that are responsible for keeping the cell dead, and in AML, the ones that are responsible for keeping the cell alive go bonkers. And sometimes it's this one, sometimes it's this one, sometimes it's that one. In CLL, it's always this one. And that makes it clear well, I'll show you in a second why um, the development of BCL2 inhibitors has been so successful in CLL. So 
once this discovery was made, it was very um, it was a matter of time before pharmaceutical companies and biotech was able to develop specific inhibitors for these anti-apoptotic family members. First, they started off with weak PAN inhibitors, then strong um, inhibitors that were less selective, and now with the drug that is approved for CLL and really making headway in AML, ABT199 or Venetoclax. Now, there are various MCL1 inhibitors in development, and my laboratory has been a part of this, and I, I have a bias to try to uh, talk about how this might be part of therapy in the future. So you'll have to uh, bear with me in, in a moment as I talk about that. Now, Navitoclax, or ABT263, uh, looked like a promising drug. It certainly kills the leukemia cells. It kills a lot of different tumor cells. But as you can see from this Journal um, of Clinical Oncology article in 2011, all these patients who had solid tumors, their platelet count dropped within a week um, almost, you know, 80%. And that quickly led to the um, the um, canceling of the development program. And whether the patients got the drug 21 days or 14 out of 21 days, they had dangerously low platelets. Now, we're less worried about this in AML than we are in solid tumors, but it's certainly something to pay attention to. Interestingly, Navitoclax is now being used in the development of myeloproliferative neoplasms. In myeloproliferative neoplasms, patients often have elevated platelets, and when the platelets start off much, much higher, a drop in platelets is actually desirable. So we'll have to see how that development goes. Venetoclax now is a specific BCL2 inhibitor, and as I mentioned, CLL, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia, is entirely dependent on BCL2, and that explains why you see these beautiful plots. This is um, These are different indices to measure lymphocyte count, bone marrow, but I picked the nodal mass because patients tend to concentrate on this. This is the size of the node um, that people had, the lymph node that people had, and Pretty much every single patient at all dose levels that received venetoclax, and this was published in New England Journal three years ago, uh, had uh, at least a 50%, and many with 75 or greater uh, percent reduction in their lymph nodes. Only three patients had um, either uh, you know a very small to moderate increase in the size of their nodes. So this is now approved for a special type of CLL called 17p deleted CLL, and is a mainstay in the in the treatment of refractory CLL patients. But what about AML? Well, in the laboratory, we found that treatment of patients with uh, venetic, or treatment, treatment of, of mice that had uh, leukemia injected into their bone marrow, um, patient, or the, these, these mice could have leukemia uh, held at bay much better than mice that weren't treated. The vehicle just means they're treated with saline or some other kind of non-placebo uh, type drug. Uh, uh, injection, and these these uh, mice received the the ABT199, the venetoclax, and you can see by the red meaning more leukemia. These are tagged leukemia cells. The bone marrow of these mice is uh, virtually absent or with minor levels of of leukemia, as opposed to fulminant um, leukemia seen in these vehicle mice. And this led to a survival improvement in the mice, um, uh, and and got people excited about using this in 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 patients. Also, interestingly, is Despite our obsession, interest uh, in looking at at uh, mutations in AML, and of course the importance both prognostically and for some treatments, this treatment doesn't really seem to matter what kind of mutation the patient has. It's um, you know a, a a mutation agnostic type of therapy. This is a series of 20 patients or so studied in Dr. Latai's lab, published in Cancer Discovery four years ago, where patients have a variety of different mutations and received either venetoclax or nevitoclax and really had um, these, this is uh, IC50 basically means how potent of uh, uh, the drug is or how little of the drug is needed to kill the cells, 50% of the cells. And you can see that in all these patient samples, regardless of the types of mutations that were found, um, the, um, the, the, the uh, drug was, the drugs were both effective and one mutation didn't pop up more on this end of the, of the uh, graph than this end. This is the, the less sensitive and this is the more sensitive. Now, we went to look at single-agent venetoclax in patients who were really in bad shape, relapse refractory patients, and found, unfortunately, that only 6% of patients had a complete remission. And this was um, 
demoralizing, but there's a reason for that I'll talk about in just a second, not the least of which is patients who have BCL2 sensitivity or reliance on the BCL2 protein did better than those who, who were resistant. And these patients probably had reliance on MCL1 or BCLXL, some of those other proteins that I talked about a few slides ago. Well, why was single-agent therapy not successful? Well, we think that it has to do with priming of the cells. So if you just kind of look at this teeter-totter here, I talked about anti-apoptotic proteins and pro-apoptotic proteins. Unprimed cells have a balance, or in cancer, even more pro um, I'm sorry, or even more anti-apoptotic proteins as measured by um, you know, heavier weight on this, on this balance. What happens uh, if you give the BH3 um, Mimetic, or uh, I'm sorry, the venetoclax, if the patient is BCL2 dependent and you push down the pro-apoptotic or the pro-death signal and you give a little bit of chemo, that cell will die because that's pushed all the way to the edge of the cliff. In other words, giving chemo here when you have lots of anti-death signal going on doesn't work as well. That makes a lot of sense. Cells primed for conventional chemotherapy are more likely to die than those that are unprimed. So that led to the, the, the two kind of canonical um, uh, studies of venetoclax plus dacogenerase acetidine or venetoclax plus low-dose C. I've used both of these in great detail, um, but the, the uh, original studies were conducted by Courtney Denarm, Dan Pollier, and others uh, with, with hypomethylene agents, and the venetoclax and low-dose C were conducted by uh, myself and co my colleague Stephen Strickland here at Vanderbilt with some folks in Australia led by An Dr. Andrew Way. And uh, the, the Venetoclax Plus DNMT, DMTI study has already been published in Lancet Oncology. This is the reference here, according to Donato, at this um, reference. And basically, patients were escalated in various doses of Venetoclax with either decitabine or azacitidine. And then after we figured out the dose, we did an expansion stage where people got decitabine. Um, oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is... Uh, um, yeah, they either got decitabine or azacitidine plus venetoclax at 400 or decitabine or azacitidine plus venetoclax at 800. And just to kind of cut to the chase, um, oh, one quick thing I do want to tell you. Um, so patients who uh, get venetoclax must be kind of ramped up in dose where we're very carefully watching uh, how they do because – this drug works so well that patients, when this drug was first started in CLL, patients, there were a couple of patients that had extreme tumor lysis syndrome, cardiac arrhythmias, and death. So now the drug is given uh, in a ramp-up fashion, low doses over time. This is uh, the 400 milligram schedule is start at 20, then 50, then 100, then 200, then 400, and so on and so forth, these different levels. In the first cycle, just to make sure in the hospital the patient doesn't have tumor lysis syndrome, And you can see here remarkable remission rates with a complete remission as high as, you know, 40% um, with the decitabine and venetoclax and a CRI. And many of these CRIs have, since this graph was made, converted to, to pure CRs, indicating a CRCRI rate of 76%. And many of these are durable. I have patients who are two and three years out of therapy, and their biggest complaint is coming back monthly to pick up their pills. In little CRC, we haven't published this yet, but similar results and maybe even a better complete remission, uh, definitely a better complete remission rate, maybe a better overall uh, remission rate in a drug, low dose CRC, that uh, just a few years ago was considered not too dissimilar from placebo. Uh, so we're very excited about this combination as well. Now, why is a drug that was considered similar to placebo as good as a hypomethylene agent with venetoclax? goes back to that same reason we said a couple slides ago, this idea of priming with some kind of um, with some kind of BH3 mimetic, driving this towards a pro-apoptotic state closer to the edge of the cliff, then giving a little bit of chemo, I guess in this graph uh, made out by the spikes at the bottom of the cliff or the pointy rocks, to cause the cell death. <laughs> 
what's interesting about low-dose CRC is there were even some patients um, who had prior DNMTI or HMA failure and went on to then go and get a complete remission with the low-dose CRC. So lots of promise for this combination. But it's not 100%. So the question is, why do they, so patients not respond? Well, this is in press. This isn't published yet, but this is from my laboratory, indicating that in a variety of AML cell lines listed here, um, some of the AML cell lines are dependent on different MCL1 proteins. Now, this is protein expression. So MOLM16, for example, has lots of MCL1 and no BCL2. So you would imagine a BCL2 inhibitor wouldn't work so well. Likewise, KG1 is entirely BCL2 and maybe a little BCLXL and no MCL1. So unlike CLL, which is entirely BCL2, AML is heterogeneous between these different proteins. To make matters a bit more complicated is there's a special technique called BH3 profile, which is actually more accurate than the actual levels of protein, and that is, makes it a little difficult in the clinic to determine who is actually relying on which type of protein. Remember I showed you in the beginning the monotherapy with venetoclax and patients had a disappointing response rate. What they found in that study, though, is that the patients um, who were on the study, that this is the, the strongest correlation they saw, was the patients who were on the study the shortest amount of time, closest to this line here, were the patients that had the highest amount of reliance on MCL1. That's what this means down here. So in other words, if you give a BCL2 inhibitor to a patient who isn't relying on BCL2, you would imagine it wouldn't work so well. It wouldn't work so well. So I'll show you um, some very early data. I normally don't show this to patients, but um, uh, it's very exciting. I want you to, to kind of see where this is going. Um, there are MCL1 inhibitors in study. We uh, developed one here at Vanderbilt. Uh, and um, giving, pay, giving mice um, very low doses of uh, venetoclax or very low doses of the MCL1 inhibitor led to leukemia, kind of similar to this black line of just giving the mice placebo alone. But if you give the combination of both drugs at otherwise you know, homeopathic doses, you get a reduction in the amount of leukemia. And you can see that when you go on and look in the bone marrow of the mice, it looks like it doesn't really have much leukemia at all, as opposed to the brown here, which is lots of leukemia there and there. I'm sorry, this is spleen in the bottom and bone marrow here. So you can see a, a great reduction in the amount of um, leukemia in this last column here. So there are a couple of MCL1 uh, inhibitors in trial right now. Um, these are the NCT numbers. This study is with S64315, um, which is a Servier compound. Um, and this is the uh, Amgen compound, AMG176. Uh, both are very exciting. We'll have to see how they look. They're still in phase one dose escalation studies. The question, though, is based on our preclinical data and based on what we understand about different types of reliance on these different different proteins, If what would the paradigm look like now that venetoclax is available? If a, if a tumor in a patient might have some MCL1 driven cells like these red cells and has some BCL2 driven cells like these purple cells, you can imagine that uh, you can give a BCL2 inhibitor with low dose CRC or even idorubicin or low, you know, a hypomethylating agent. I frankly don't know why you do idorubicin because this one has problems and is a more difficult drug to, to give. But these two drugs, we had 70% response rate and long term survival, and maybe some people think even some cures. Of course, experimentally, we're looking at combination of BCL2 inhibition with some of the drugs that I mentioned today. Now, is this similar in MCL1, where if you have an MCL1 dominant tumor, you might be able to give an MCL1 inhibitor at first, and if they were to relapse, you could then give a BCL2 inhibitor, or maybe up front with that MCL1 inhibitor, we're going to have success in combination with these other therapies and get long-term disease-free survivals. This is probably a couple years out before we'll know this answer, but this is kind of where the field is going. Likewise, we'll be studying this, I'm sure, with novel therapy that I mentioned today. The question is, um, can we just ignore mutations if we really attack this with both drugs at once? So let's say these, these cells are dependent on MCL1 or BCL2, and we give both drugs 
to begin with. Well, in the setting of Veneticlax, which is going to be on the market soon, is now uh, for AML, which is on the market already for CLL, and it's in clinical study. What if you add it with drugs? Well, there's clinical studies going on right now with drugs that actually are weak inhibitors of MCL1, these three drugs. We don't know how that's going to go, but it's very encouraging based on the mouse data I showed you before and the safety profile of these drugs, which looks pretty good. Down the road, I also mentioned true MCL1 inhibitors, which are coming up, and if we can combine those with Venetoclax, that's where a lot of us are excited. I have to thank Dan Pollier, um, who uh, wrote what I was thinking about a year ago. Uh, and he went out there on a limb uh, and, and, and actually claimed heresy, uh, heresy that, that, that we should abandon induction chemotherapy uh, because the data is, is, is getting there. But we're not – arguably, Dan might, might have been the first on the boat, and, and I think this is a boat, though, that is seaworthy. Many of us are starting to think this way and are trying to find ways to get around cytotoxic chemotherapy. Patients who come into the um, – clinic now don't necessarily have this available to them, but maybe six months from now, more patients will, and a year from now, this might be approved and be standard of care. I'm very thankful to all of you listening. I'm especially grateful to the patients. I'm happy to do this webinar if it helps you understand better your disease and what's available to you. Thank you very, very much, and I'm very happy to take questions. I see several of them here, and Angie, I guess with your permission, I'll go ahead and answer these unless there's a way I'm supposed to do this. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Savona. Um, I will go ahead and moderate the questions, and so if you can just follow along with me, that would be great. Okay. Um, our first question comes from Tracy. Tracy is asking, is treatment-related leukemia always a poor prognosis if complete remission was reached after the first induction and the patient is otherwise healthy, meaning no co comorbidities? Yeah, so it's a great question, and if I didn't make that clear uh, when I was talking, I apologize because I'm sensitive to talking to patients when um, I say this is a miserable prognosis and the patient that's on the phone might have that, might be doing fine. Remember, this is epidemiology, so there's a 1,000 patients who might have this, and there's 20 of them who might be doing great. That still means 980 are not. So epidemiologically, it's a bad prognosis risk, uh, bad risk disease. But if a patient is in remission and doing well, that might be one of those patients who's an exception. And that doesn't mean that we don't treat those patients aggressively. It just means that um, we look harder for experimental therapy. We're less interested in the standard of care uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy and so forth and so on. So hopefully that answers your question, Tracy. All right. Thank you. Our next question comes from Margaret. Uh, Margaret's asking, regarding traditional cytoxic therapy for AML, what options are available for patients who have, who already have heart failure, and, second, and secondly, what degree of heart failure would preclude treatment? In other words, what injection fraction is the cutoff for standard cytoxic drugs? Yeah, so standard cytotoxic drugs, um, the, well, really for, for most drugs, the answer is um, you got to be careful. Um, patients who have an EF that's greater than 40% usually can get, or 45% depending on the clinical trial, usually can get on clinical trials unless there is a specific cardiotoxic signal like an anthracycline. We, um, we, 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 we also have clinical, we also have um, drugs available like hypomethylating agents that we give to patients who have heart failure with a lower ejection fraction. There's ways to work with this. Everyone um, who sees me who has cardiac disability and certainly folks who are at other great centers around the country who have good leukemia programs uh, will send their patients to um, you know, uh, a cardio-oncology partner who can assess risk and me medically manage the best as possible, and then you can, you, know, you, you can approach that issue. I've had patients who've had an ejection fraction as low as 15% in the setting of sepsis with their AML, and then you know, we medically manage them, get them through that difficult time, and their heart failure revert reverses. On the other hand, there's people who have known heart failure from you know, whatever, a virus as a child or from a heart attack, and it may not be reversible at all, and we have to find the best way to treat those patients. And the answer to the question Margaret asked specifically about cytotoxic chemotherapy might be that cytotoxic chemotherapy may not be in the cards. All right. Thank you. 
Our next question comes from Lee. Lee would like to know, uh, her mom has recently been diagnosed with AML. They are trying to decide the best treatment. Um, how do they decide if bone marrow transplant is best? Oh, boy, that's a whole other webinar. Uh, so, so Lee, I, I think, um, you know, there are lots of things that help us decide whether or not someone should go to allogeneic stem cell transplant. And the what I try to do is empower my patients to understand as best as possible uh, what the epidemiology is, what the prognostication is, and what the risks are to help them make that decision. Um, people say, well, what would you do if it's your mother? And I always say that it's my... You know, if it was my mother at the at the at the beginning of the strip in Vegas, and my father at the beginning of the strip in Vegas with a suitcase for cash, my father would have it locked and unopened at the end, and my mother would have spent it and regained it four times. And uh, that's just a, a, a difference in personality and how people want to approach, um, you know, a, a risk uh, situation. Some people are very risk averse. Some people are um, are, are not. Um, I think that um, stem cell transplant, there are definitely uh, green lights and, and red lights. Uh, people who are um, you know, have significant comorbidities, have don't have a good social situation, uh, don't have um, uh, they have a a high risk of not surviving the transplant. Those are people we don't consider. The people who um, you know are are younger, uh, people who have less comorbidities, have good physiology, have good support networks. Uh, those are people we do consider. And 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 I I know that you're probably asking more about the specific pathology. And I'll just say that standardly, patients who have favorable um, risk leukemia, we don't take the stem cell transplant. And everyone else, it's kind of fair game. Where if patients are physiologically able to get stem cell transplant and they're high risk, we recommend it. If they're physiologically able to get transplant and have a good donor um, and they're inter in their intermediate risk, we talk about it at length and it becomes a very uh, complicated informed decision between the patient, the family, and the leukemia specialist. All right. Thank you. Our next question comes from Dory. Dory would like to know, I'm interested in researching clinical trials for AML. How can I do this? Wow. Well, I think it depends on where you are. Um, so um, the the uh, best kind of first step is to reach out if you're if you really don't uh, not familiar. You go to a webinar like you did today and, and probably get familiar with some of the agents that you might be interested in, and hopefully that was helpful to you. Uh, I think the uh, AMDS uh, IF is is a fantastic organization that can kind of put you in touch with people in your area that are well vetted and have a good reputation and know the science and are on top of the investigation and different clinical trials. Uh, there's certainly um, uh, public resources like the clinicaltrials.gov and clinicaltrials.gov you can search by disease uh, and that can be a little overwhelming it's a bit like a Google search trying to find clinical trials so it helps to get guidance from um, somebody uh, close by uh, obviously um, there are people who live um, in an area that isn't served uh, within 100 or 200 miles for, with a, a leukemia specialist, and you know the the, the uh, comprehensive cancer centers throughout the NCS the NCCN designated comprehensive cancer centers all have strong leukemia programs, um, and they are uh, I would find the closest one to you and uh, request an appointment there. And certainly uh, the AMDS, uh, myself included, and any of the advisors would be willing to make recommendations on folks in those areas. I know it's a it's it's kind of a just one more thing to say about that. I I mean it's a it's a it's a uh, sometimes debilitating problem to try to find what is the best clinical trial and how do I get hooked up with it. Uh, it's almost um, too much information and trying to get some guidance on that. But really uh, relying on your local resources and the you know the more superlative grassroots organizations like AMDS, Leukemia Lymphoma Society, um, and and MDSF and so forth. Forth, you you can you can uh, really get a head start. Thank you, Dr. Savona. And yes, um, for anyone that is looking for um, assistance and researching a clinical trial, we're more than happy to help. Um, if you can just email us at help, that's H-E-L-P at aamds.org, um, our patient educator can assist with that. 
All right. Uh, our next question comes from Nelson. Nelson would like to know, are MDS patients treated differently if they develop AML than AML patients who did not have MDS? Um, right. So I think that, um, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the first few slides, patients who have MDS that turns to AML is particularly high risk. So um, I think Dory asked if a patient who's, who gets looked at for stem cell transplant. So if we have someone who's got MDS that turns to AML and they are otherwise a good candidate for stem cell transplant, we try to find a donor and get that patient a transplant because their chance of survival with, with standard conventional therapy is not that good. What changes... Um, What's changing now is that the standard of care is going to improve dramatically, so the decisions on going to transplant will change. For example, um, you know, if if um, there is better therapy available, the, taking the risk of stem cell transplant or moving forward with that type of uh, potentially life-saving therapy is less attractive if there's good therapy, and the therapy is getting better and better. I think we know that patients with treatment-related AML or secondary uh, AML, like they they had a treatment, they had a, a, a antecedent hematologic disease, which means they had MDS prior, are folks we want to be aggressive with. And if those folks are over the age of 70 or otherwise not good candidates for stem cell transplant, then we need to find the best ways to get them to a center where they could be on a clinical trial maximizing their remission. If they've got a remission with some standard care uh, therapy, fantastic. Uh, but keeping a very close eye on that remission and looking to for the transition to the clinical trial is smart because more of those patients than not will eventually uh, relapse uh, and uh, not have a standard care available option. All right. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jennifer. Jennifer would like to know, what is the best way to get in touch with you to discuss if this trial is appropriate for a patient, and do you provide consultations over the phone? Uh, well, um, I'm happy to talk with anyone. I mean, um, you know, I, it's probably best to come in person, and I would I would encourage anyone on the phone um, who wanted to have a consult with me to talk with AMDS first uh, because they might be able to answer some of the questions. If you can't get to where you need to go work after talking with AMDS, I'm more than happy to speak with folks, and we can certainly triangulate and, and be put in touch um, through Angie and her and her crew. Thank I you hope that answers you. your question. Yes, uh, and Dr. Savona said it perfectly. Um, for anyone that has any questions, we might be able to answer your questions at first, and if not, we might uh, be able to connect with Dr. Savona. So if you can just please email us or call us. Um, our email is help, H-E-L-P, at AMDS.org, or you can call us directly at 800-747-2820. All right, our next question comes from Paul. Paul is a caregiver for an MDS patient with blood count levels of 6 to 7 that have been boosted by Procrit and transfusion. The patient is 92. Would any of these treatments be appropriate for an MDS pre-AML elderly patient? Yeah, so um, good question. I don't think anything that, that I talked about today would be um, – well, we don't know. So venetoclax is being tested in MDS as a disease-modifying agent, so we don't have the answer yet. For, for, for patients who have MDS but don't have, you know, that high blast count that's transitioning to AML, but their biggest problem is getting transfused, there's a new drug coming out called loose patercept, um, and uh, that drug uh, is probably going to be approved at the end of this year, and it really has uh, been amazing for people with respect to driving up their hemoglobin, even when erythropoietin stops working. Uh, that drug is spelled L-U-S-P-A-T-E-R-C-P-T, um, loose patercept. The um, dr the uh, paper describing the the uh, drug at the phase two study, well, the senior author is uh, Uwe Plotzberger, P A P L A T Z B E R G E R, and it was published. Um, 
I in Lancet Oncology, I think, at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. So um, those things are findable. And, you know, when the drug gets approved, it can be gotten anywhere in the United States. Until it's approved, it's it, it could be gotten potentially on compassionate use. But those are really sticky situations, um, and it's hard. As you can imagine, a company's trying to get drug approval, they sometimes are resistant to offer the drug on compassionate use that might endanger their uh, application to the FDA. As uh, callous as that might sound, that's the reality in drug development. All right. Thank you. Our next question comes from Margaret. Margaret would like to know, what are the adverse effects of venetoclax? Right, so venetoclax is um, extremely well tolerated. Uh, at the higher doses, we saw some people that um, had delay count recovery, and we think that people who have – so low-dose ARC doesn't really drop your counts that much, but when you take it in connection with venetoclax, there's a massive drop in counts. So people can be cytopenic for some time, and when you have when you have low cell counts, you're at risk of developing infections, consequences of having you know low hemoglobin-like um, – you know, feeling winded and ultimately a heart attack if your hemoglobin was low enough and you'd have it treated, and then bleeding with low platelets. So you have to watch that. The other thing to watch out with venetoclax, and this is something you have to really be careful of because your doctors don't know this necessarily in the community if they haven't been dosing the drug, and it's very unusual, is that drug interacts with a lot of drugs that are common in, in folks in their 60s and 70s. For example, uh, calcium channel blockers, which are commonly used for blood pressure control, interact with venetoclax. So you have to dose down venetoclax. Um, and uh, that's not kind of a normal practice for people who take care of cancer to dose down a drug based on a blood pressure medicine, but the the, the levels can get quite high if not. So you, you got to really be um, be careful with venetoclax dosing, and that's something to remember if you're going to be asking your doctor about it. All right. Thank you. Our next question comes from Daniel, and Daniel has multiple uh, questions. Um, he is curious about some of the drugs that you spoke about being used in combination with a telomore such as a metal stat. Um, he says, what do you think the benefit of the drug like a metal stat alone would be? And he adds on saying, I know it is being studied in MDS, but he is curious about it being studied in AML, and he would like to know if there's any clinical trials that may be already uh, studying this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know what to tell you, Dan. I, I think that... Um, it would be it would be akin to fortune telling for me to see how it's going to do in AML. The studies are ongoing in MDS. There's been some promising data with that drug, and especially in myofibrosis. But then, you know, there was a safety signal, then the drug was back on development, and then it looked kind of less impressive. But some people responded. I, I think it's a question mark. I think that I scientifically the idea is 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 good. Um, whether or not we'll be able to get mileage out of it enough to recommend for patients is is a big question mark for me. The the kind of the, the leader of development of that drug is a guy named Ayelu Tafiri at the Mayo Clinic, uh, T-E-F-F-E-R-R-I. I might have put too many Fs or too many Rs in there, but he is um, a very well-known um, uh, myoproliferative expert at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and he would be able to answer that question with um, a lot more uh, precision than than I. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. So, and I believe those are all the questions that we have today. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and for your time. I would also just like to add that if you would like to rewatch this webinar at a later time, please be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with an archive link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today, making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, that's H-E-L-P at A-A-M-D-S dot org, so that our patient educator can respond, or visit our online academy at A-A-M-D-S dot org forward slash learn for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. We appreciate your time to complete this survey. Again, thank you for joining us. And remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program. <laughs>